Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 27, 2023, are Isaiah chapter 51, 1 through 6. Our alternate first reading, Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 through chapter 2, verse 10. Psalm 138, Romans 12, 1 through 8 is our second reading, and the gospel is Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Here Big we changes are. in the mm-hmm. arc of Matthew here. Some changes? Big changes for Matthew. Big this changes is, are happening. This is a turn in the narrative uh, to the central question. Um, it's, it's always about who is Jesus. And you got to answer. Yeah. Yeah, not not what someone else says. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you say? I really appreciated uh the the story that uh Richard Ward told in in the commentary. Um uh I too have had the experience of being challenged uh, not only by my Jewish colleagues but also uh by uh, some of my Muslim colleagues that um, uh, we Christians too often apologize for our own brand. Um, so this is the text that um, reminds us what all of the book of books of Scripture are about to reveal to us who is the God made known in Jesus. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I was reminded of my. I, I've been to Caesarea Philippi. Have you've been there, Matt? Yeah, and yeah, you've been been well. yeah, yeah, and you know the the reality of the backdrop, right, of where of mm-hmm. of where this confession is actually happening is something that I always try to remember as well. That this is not in the uh, comfort of one's home or living room, hanging out, or just you know, casual meal with Jesus or something like that. It's you know, it's right there uh, in the midst of all of the competing. The, the competing voices and the competing powers uh, for for your loyalty, right? For your uh, for your dedication and your obedience, and it's in this location that that Peter has to uh, has to answer the question. And so that's another element of this text. If the preacher can kind of get around, get into that kind of tension somehow, uh, that that often. When we are, or where is it when we are asked to answer the ask this question, uh, it's not in the most comfortable places of our lives. Uh, and and what are those really asking ourselves? What are those uh, competing powers that surround us that are just right there in the backdrop, you know, whispering in our ear? And yet, and yet, no, we say, "You are the Messiah." I know who my Messiah is. Um, I know uh, the identity identity of Jesus. I know who Jesus is for me and for my life. And uh, and and I think also that question of, "But who do uh, who do you say that I am?" is uh, how would you answer that? I mean, that's the other. The, this is how Peter answers it: mm-hmm. uh, "You are the Messiah." But you might we might, you might pose that as a homiletical question as well. Like if, if you're asked that question, when you are asked that question, who do you say Jesus is? Um, say do you want to say more about the setting? I wonder if some listeners won't know what you're referring to when you talk about where they are. Oh, oh, well, uh, the, you know, shrine to Pan and uh, the various and sundry Roman gods right there in Caesarea Philippi. Uh, and so you have the competing Greek gods behind you. Um, and yeah, that's what I meant. Is yeah. that enough? Particularly if, um, particularly if there's been teaching about how the early followers, the early church, um, would hide, um, would code their confession uh, it, uh, underneath the Roman Empire. And if you've spent time explaining that, you know that, um, you know that that Christians gathered privately, quietly, you know uh, this scene, this moment while Jesus is on earth, when this turn in the gospel narrative happens, is done at the place where all of the other religious alternatives, where all the other, uh, as you said, competing gods, this, that Caesarea Philippi, 
And it is there in public that yeah. they are asked to identify. And um, it the identification is, um, uh, if I dare say, it's a recovery of of who is the one that the creator God has promised to send, the Messiah. Um, so it's not you know, it's not my best friend. It, you know, it's not the one, my, you know, pie in the sky uh, ATM. Uh, it's not, you know, the uh, T-shirt wearing one who's on my side and takes out my enemies. Um, this is who scripture has promised will come. And that's the confession that is being made. And, uh, Anything short of that, according to this text, requires an additional question, as you just posed, Caroline. It's not who they say. It's not even who Peter says. Yeah, it's you plural. Who do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, who do we say that Jesus is today? Thanks for yeah. that, Matt. Well, and, yeah, and just well, and Peter's answer is is kind of out of his mind. I mean, Jesus even says this: "You you didn't figure this out on your own. This is somehow revealed to you." Um, Peter, because it's such a ludicrous confession given where they are at this point in the story. And there's there's nothing that Jesus has done up to this point that qualifies him as the Messiah, um, according to the expectations, at least that we know about in, in Jewish texts. So this is um, Peter's laying out here the trajectory of where he thinks the story might be headed mm -hmm. when he calls Jesus the Messiah. That's more mm -hmm. anticipatory. Uh, and that's about to get redirected next week. So exactly. <laughs> it's, it's another one of these places where you really have to, kind of, I think, kind of commit to both Sundays and spend a little time this week pointing forward and next week spend some time recapitulating. Um, <clears throat> because what it means for him to be Messiah is yet to be fully grasped. And it's going to get weirder once he starts talking about, about suffering and death. And it's no, I not that's what they expect. The Messiah to be. It's not what they have been turning to as the Messiahs, the false Messiahs that they've turned to. Jesus is not going to be like those. What do we make about the last three verses here? Because I never really quite know what in the world Jesus is talking about there. I'm just, I'm pretty sure nobody else is either, even though. You know, I, about this. I wish you had to ask that. <laughs> Um, that those, those verses haunt me. Um, the things that we bind, uh, become, this is my interpretation, boundaries for people finding the peace of God, you know, the, the, you know, so bound in heaven, I'm not reading as, uh, some otherly place. Um, but I'm thinking of it in terms of the promised reign of God. And, and so when we bind things here, we put up a, a boundary for folks to experience the promise of God. And what we, um, what, what's the other thing? And, and whatever you loose on earth, well, if heaven comes to earth, if the peace and reign of God is among us, then I should have kept my mouth shut, but I'm gonna I'm committed now. It it becomes it roams the earth, it roams the place where heaven is to come. So the evil that we unleash, the hardship that we unleash, the um brokenness that we unleash, the lies that we unleash become present in this place where heaven is supposed to enter. I, 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 it haunts me to read it that way, um, which is why I, I said I probably shouldn't have answered your question because I have, I've wrestled with this text and I'm like, I keep seeing it as, you know, the good news, but also the bad news. Uh, because if heaven is here, if hospitality is supposed to be experienced here, and we put borders on that hospitality, or we let loose evil, then our neighbor cannot experience the promise and peace of God here and now. 
I don't know. That's something to wrestle with. I don't know. I, I'm definitely not ready to preach that. How about you, Matt? Do you have an interpretation of that verse? Uh, well, it's all under the umbrella of, I don't know, but I, I, I think it's, it, it's a, it's a statement where Jesus is starting to uh, unite himself and this this entity he calls the church, which is a term that no other gospel uses. Um, Matthew uses it a little bit, uh, which probably says something about where Matthew is being written from and this idea of a Christian community that now understands itself as somewhat distinctive from from synagogues and from its neighbors. I think ho hopefully our listeners know church is not a Christian word. It wasn't invented by Christians. It was already a term uh, that had a bit of resonance in the Greco-Roman world, but also in, in the Septuagint. So, um, and this means the assembly or the gathering. So, uh, and has a political connotation. So I think this is Jesus starting to talk about basically he will be known through the church uh, and the church is the main way in which he will be present to the world and within the world, not the sole way, not always the right way, in other words, but uh, the church has tremendous power to represent the power of God or to or to warp that idea um, by how it conducts itself, how we conduct ourselves, and also our own work within the world. So, I want to put that in conversation with like Matthew 13 from a couple of weeks ago with the weeds and the wheat and this mm -hmm. idea of how is God at work through a church that isn't entirely passive, but also recognize it's under kind of the power of the dominion of Jesus himself. But I don't want to go any further than that and start talking about certain modes of authority that, that certain people in the church may or may not possess and things like that. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the, I'll, I'll offer one thing here. I mean, I, that 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 binding and the loosing, uh, and really, I think needs to be put in the in that immediate context, right? Of the, of this sense of what is this designation of this community, uh, particularly uh, when you think of the alternative realities of. Of, of Rome's kind of order and that this is going to be this is going to be the kingdom of heaven and so there is a there's an an invitation or an inkling toward a kind of authority that the disciples are going to be given uh, to to embody and but also to interpret Jesus teachings for the sake of uh, for the sake of what this kingdom of heaven is going to look like and so I think that I think that authority needs to be connected to uh, to that as well, um, and and that it's that it has this uh, the the responsibility has to do with what Jesus has been doing all along. Of you are charged with you know you are my students and I'm teaching you some stuff, and uh, and how are you going to uh, what is that now authority and responsibility going to look like? Uh, particularly if it's based on a on this specific claim of Jesus as the Messiah, that that's that's the that's the rock, you know, right? That's the that's the primary claim. And so, how does that then how does that then shape how you hear Jesus' teachings, how you interpret Jesus Jesus' teachings, how you interpret Scripture? So that's those all have to be in the same conversation. Yeah, Matthew 18, he's going to talk a lot about the church and the church's role. We'll get to that in a couple of weeks when some passages about forgiveness, but also in passages that aren't picked up by the lectionary about the community of faith's uh, responsibility to look out for the most vulnerable. And I think some of that's connected here uh, as well. I think you brought up, I th you were alluding to Matthew 28, to the Great Commission, I think, Caroline, as well, when you talked about authority and, and, and the teaching ministry. But anyway... More to come in the weeks ahead, I'm sure. Yes. All right, Isaiah that. 51, how would you make some connections here? Well, g given that it's with Matthew 16, it's a text that I think you have to read Christologically. I mean, in, yeah. in a way we do that with all Old Testament texts, but we sometimes try to not jump too quickly to that. But, you know, if Jesus is going to uh, accept the title Messiah, then, you know, there, there are no Old Testament texts where God says to Abraham, I'm going to send the Messiah through you or something like that. But of course, through various ways of reading, uh, the Messiah has to answer the Abrahamic promise in some way, somehow. 
and so in some ways I think this Isaiah text is, is, is pulling that back in, but I would also still read it very much, you know, you have to read it in its historical context. And Amy Odin's got some great stuff there about trying to set the stage for utter defeat <laughs> and being utterly disheartened and to make the promise or to make the claim, look back to Abraham and Sarah, remember, uh, remember the, what was it? Remember the rock from which you were hewn. See, that's, I thought that was the connection, you know, maybe rock, but... rocks, <laughs> rocks, quarry. Oh, let's pick Petros. rocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe I, I'd prefer to talk about the Messiah as an Abrahamic. Yeah. Um, fulfillment. I thought, I thought one of you was going to say rock. So I was like really hoping. It, it that could be that silly. There. <laughs> There's the I, connection. I, I, I too. And, there, and now you have a prop, right? Now you, every, all the preachers can bring different rocks and like, which rock do you want? And it is, yeah, it is so. late summer. People are looking for ideas. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> no, I well, think that's, oh, go ahead, Joy. Yeah, I was also going to point point to the commentary. Um, uh, I think that uh, Amy does a wonderful job, and particularly in, in full agreement with Matt, uh, in particularly in setting this picture, she says, you will need to draw the picture for your audience so that they can recognize this. And, and I think um, that's always true for a text, but it's particularly true for this one, uh, as Matt has already identified, that the promised one is not a, a 2000 year old idea, but it is the creator God's intention always for the world. And so go all the way back to how this promise gets started. And it's promised that the blessing for all the nations will be from this one nation. And that's what brings us to this moment. And um, Isaiah's just that big book from, um, uh, a, a, a dare I say that favorite classic uh, that that it's the fifth gospel. It's the fifth gospel uh, that narrates uh, the promises of God from uh, a history of Exodus, a reality of exile, and the promise of this exuberant God who hasn't given up on us. And it's your favorite book, Joy. You told us that once. It is. It is <laughs> because it ties so much together. You know, if you got to have one book, yeah. let's take this one because it here here you come, Caroline, because it's the rock from which we're hewn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's so. I mean, it's the way in which you, like you said, Joy, and well, but both of you said that this making that continuance, right? That the, the continuance of the of the Messiah and uh, and the qualities of that Messiah of justice and deliverance and salvation. And so that's that's and that's the going back to the Matthew text, that's one thing that I think your comment was helpful, Matt, that this is kind of a beginning because what does it mean to call Jesus as the Messiah is now going to be now going to be unpacked as we go forward in the gospel. And uh, and and here you have here you have some of those those qualities of God that are are also going to be manifested in the Messiah. So, all right, and rocks, <laughs> and rocks. <laughs> and so now, the semi continues. So, Matt, you've already said you know you've already challenged us to to uh, to do this and to stay in this Matthew lane. Uh, because we've been building to it. We're in the year of Matthew. Um, we're going to focus on that. But just in case you've been working through um, uh, the Old Testament, this is, um, this is a chapter I can't um, decide which one to preach from because they're both great. And I say that in the sense of, Caroline, we always say you have to find your focus um, because the texts are rich. And uh, so I'm going to let um, Kimberly Rousseau's um, focus on um, that first women's mission society uh, attentive to the needs of women and children, my words, um, a sermon I preach called Midwives Matter. Um, Kimberly focuses on that because that's the other question of this text. And I'm just going to ask the question, how do you not know Joseph? In using using this question of looking to the rock from which you are hewn, 
Um, here in the Old Testament, we have the leaders of that empire, Egypt, not knowing their own history. How has Egypt survived? They're survived because of this um, uh, forefather of the Israelites, and he doesn't know his history. And what does it mean for us to not know our history? Um, and so, if you're not gonna, if you're going to do Exodus, and you're not gonna focus on the midwives, then I think there's a whole lot to focus on understanding what it means to forget your history and to not know Joseph and the reason that you are where you are. And that becomes a societal question. What is the church done in society? Hospitals, orphanages, schools, social organizations. Are we still the community that makes that kind of impact? Or have we become so lost in our task that the society has forgotten, forgotten that we are the very ones that have given uh, a foundation for the good in society? That's just what I would throw out there for a homiletical move. I think if also if you have not been um, <clears throat> following the semi-continuous, this is a good place you might jump in because the story yeah. has changed so much, not just with the jump mm -hmm. from Genesis to Exodus, but um, a lot of time has passed since mm -hmm. Joseph's story. Like you said, Joy, there's a, a sense of lost memory here. It also reminds us that Joseph's the reason why so many people are enslaved. That's part of the story that we skipped over at the end of Genesis. Right. That's, that was part of the bargain, so to speak, for keeping people alive. So now, right, you've got this enslaved nation uh, that's going to suffer under taskmasters. You've got three women here that people need to know about, at least three, with Shifra and Pua. Um, Miriam's not mentioned by name, but we assume that's the sister, um, who all act courageously. You've got a passage here about controlling uh, reproduction um, and women and their babies, which resonates um, mm -hmm. in terms of a strategy that, that you know, that, that Pharaoh deploys. Um, mm -hmm. And then you've got defiance of that at a very personal, local level, so to speak. There's just a lot in these, in these verses um, that can take you into some really important topics. Absolutely. Yeah, and and I think it is one of those stories that if if you've never preached it or uh, or you you're not really sure, you know if you know if your your congregation knows of Shapram Pua and Miriam, I think it's I, I think it's just such a it's such an important story uh, that that has that lifts up the roles of these women uh, to. Uh, for the sake of the next leader of God's people, right? And without them, where would Moses be? You know, even the other women who are are here, uh, you know, the woman conceived and bore a son. Okay, and then uh, then you've got. Let's see, her sister stood at a distance. His sister stood at a distance. Right, see what happened. And then um, while her attendants walked beside yeah, the river, and it's just like packed full of women. <laughs> <laughs> that are all having their different roles here. Okay. Uh, and and we don't get many stories like this in, in scripture where where you have this group of women whose 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 uh activity <laughs> makes all the different all the different literally all the difference in the world. So I think it would just yeah for this for the sake of God's uh God's vision and God's uh and God's yeah, I have to imagine Pharaoh's daughter also puts herself at risk in this yeah, in some way. They yeah. don't, the text doesn't really dwell on that, but she obviously recognizes the boy as a Hebrew. Yeah, she's not going to um, be the only one for sure. Yeah, and Moses' mother as well. But there's yeah, almost yeah. everybody's defiant at some level. Exactly. To the, yeah. So to, it's to not the just decree. Yeah. So it's not just the midwives. It's it's all of these women are taking risks in in some way, shape, or form, and um, so that's. And in, that, and in that, they all become midwives. Yeah. Holding yeah. God's promise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and well, I, they don't do it necessarily out of faith. Like, it's not even clear that Shifra and Pua are Hebrews themselves. I mean, these are just people right. who are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And in the process, we might say they unknowingly participate in God's you know, unfolding plan, right? Which is, in other words, you don't have to 
And the fact that these people aren't evangelized or something like that isn't necessarily a, a problem, so to speak, in what the text is trying to say. And, and and a recognition also that that God, this God, is up to something. Any right. thoughts on the psalm? Well, I think the the this is one of those places where uh, I'm going to beat you to the punch and say I would use it liturgically um, because uh, it expresses each of the texts. I mean, in 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 you know whether we're talking about um, anticipating. Uh, the um, uh, the desires of uh, Israel, uh, enslaved Israel's, um, you know, they cry out and they're answered. Whether you're anticipating uh, the desires of Moses' mother, not that she would lose her son, um, the recognition that um, we're going to call out on naming who is our God, um, and, and say that we will give thanks to God, that we will acknowledge. I mean, d- either of the texts invite us uh, to respond with uh, Psalm 138. Mm, yeah. Good plan. I like that plan. That's what I was going to say. Me too. <laughs> uh, all right, Romans 12. If you haven't been doing Romans, this is a place you can drop in and pick it up as well. Or, or a significant change in the letter, or you know, the, the therefore. And and in this sense of what I've mentioned before, in in referencing reading Romans backwards, uh, the book by Scott McKnight, um, this is a place where we get to where it's going. So just as we talked about the Matthew text, you know, what is it about? It's always about Jesus. It's always about the God made known in Jesus, and Matthew makes that turn. Well, here um, in Romans, it's heading toward hospitality and unity. It's heading toward peace among a, a discordant community. And, and in all of those ways, This is the invitation for us to come forward, to offer ourselves, and by us, I mean the assembly, the people of God, just as um, the uh, Hebrew women, uh, the um, midwives have offered themselves up uh, in a sacrificial way. Um, We have gifts. We have something to offer. Our our position is never sidelined. And, and so Paul is appealing for us to be able to uh, not be conformed to what is popular in the world, but to be transformed by the hospitality and peace that is the unchanging promise of God. So yeah, this is a place where you could drop in on Romans. Yeah, whenever I teach Paul, when I get to uh, <clears throat> to Romans twelve or to Galatians five or to like First Thessalonians four, uh, any former students who are listening might might remember this. I I have a little spiel right about this is not the beginning of the ethical part of the letter. It's not like you can split Paul between theology first then ethics later. Everything he does is theology, and so I I, I was I had teachers who taught me never to refer to Paul's ethics. Um, which implies that he's working out of a kind of uh, kind of an abstract system of the good or the right or the beautiful. Um, it's all theology for Paul, right? And so this is all rooted in that. This is your spiritual worship or this is your reasonable service. In other words, this is simply how you act if everything I've said so far is, is true. Um, that's a distinction that might not have much of a difference. It might not preach well, but just to help people get a sense because the popular opinion of Paul is still very much he's a rules guy or he's a control freak and all of this stuff. And I think that's a misreading of Paul. I think there are some issues with Paul, but um, but nevertheless, he's suggesting that the, what it means to be set free from sin is going to manifest itself. The work of the Spirit is going to manifest itself in and particular think, ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the one of the ways in which you you just see that going on is um, in verse six, where you know we have gifts that differ according to the grace. Well, gifts is charismata, right, uh, and grace is charin, and so you have this, you know, these it, that 
these gifts that we've been given are are extensions of or embodiments of of the grace that we have been given and so there's no that that embodiment I mean, it's another way to think about how that one's ethical or one's behavior is is uh is it cannot be untangled from one's theological <laughs> uh commitments and so it's uh, they're intertwined uh forever and ever and that's in part what paul's up to without words our practices should proclaim who we say jesus is <laughs>